this seminar is devoted to the outrageous ideas which Aldous Huxley put forward in his book, Island, <clears throat> where he made himself a sitting duck for every kind of sophisticated derision. He attacked the sacred cow of the American family. He advocated mystical experience through using drugs. He discussed tantric sex practices. He uh, discussed rational modes of economics. And he proposed an, a utopia, which is a thing that just no realistic, hard-headed person has done for a long, long time. He, as you know, wrote a book called Brave New World, which was a very cogent prognostication of what the completely automated, technologically superior society would be like. And it's very, very easy to poke fun, to satirize, to deride. And Huxley has been an expert at poking all kinds of fun and sophisticated uh, criticism of social institutions, of aesthetics, of religious ideas, and of human character. But when a man who has devoted his life, in a way, to being the master satirist, has suddenly to turn round and, as it were, redeem himself by saying, now after I've pulled you all apart, this is the kind of world I would really like. That's the most difficult thing to do today. Because today, uh, nobody who is intellectually respectable believes that the world is going to improve. Uh, the, the general climate of opinion is that uh, pretty much the evolution of man has reached a limit point, And that from now on, if anything, we are more likely to deteriorate than improve because we are faced with a number of absolutely uh, fantastic problems. Any one of them taken singly is enough to, to terrify you, but when you take them all together, it presents a pretty hopeless prospect. Overpopulation, uh, wastage of the natural resources, the uh, madness of technology harnessed to lunatics in charge of politics, and uh, the increasing strain of the speed at which we live, its effect on our nerves, and furthermore the fact that the more technology develops, the less room there is for individual freedom so that everybody will have to be regulated, organized, and so on. Uh, when you take all these things together, they present a pretty gloomy prospect so that nowadays it's fashionable in the intellectual world to consider any sort of utopian thinking completely naive and unrealistic. So you see, when Aldous Huxley wrote Island, he did something at the end of his life which was the most difficult task that he ever set himself. And he wrote it in the form of a novel because, after all, he is generally known as a novelist. And it's very difficult, you know, to step out of role in this culture. If you're a novelist and you sell well as a novelist, that's what you're expected to do. If you're a philosopher, you're expected to be a philosopher. And you mustn't, I mean, it would be quite wrong for me to turn around and write a novel. That would be a catastrophe. And uh, you, you've got to keep to your role because if you don't, people don't know who you are. And it's very difficult for a man of wide intelligence. Aldous Huxley was practically what we sometimes call a polymath, a Renaissance man, a man with enormous interests. And who, as a matter of fact, wrote fairly extensively in other forms than the novel anthologies, essays, and so on. <clears throat> but he, in a way, having made a novel out of Brave New World, he had to make a novel out of the other side of the picture, Island, even though the book is not successful as a novel. That is to say, as the form of the novel, it doesn't come off because what the novel is expected to do is not so much to expound ideas to convey a message except in the most subtle way. A novel is not supposed to comment on life. 
A novel is supposed to describe life. And so it's very difficult when the novelist turns preacher or philosopher or social critic and makes his characters give lectures. One would feel happier if one had a book of essays, you see, than if the characters were giving lectures. But he had to do this, and if you simply disregard this and don't approach the book as uh, with, with having in your mind the prejudices which critics have instilled in you and which make you look for a novel as a novel and everything has to be in this compartment, everything has to be in that compartment, just so, then you'll find that this is an astonishing book. Just take it for what it is. Now, as I said, he, he made himself a sitting duck for all kinds of critical derision because of these very far out and peculiar ideas which uh, constitute the underlying philosophy of the book. And I want to start by some sort of reminiscence about Aldous Huxley to show how he moved to this position or this complex of positions and where he started from. <coughs> This may be absolutely old news to some of you, but uh, I want to sum it up in a certain way and couple it with some personal reminiscences. Back in the early 1930s, Aldous Huxley was a liberating force for very many people, young people, especially in England, recovering from the effects of British education. British education for the middle and upper classes is based on private schools, although they're called public schools. And this kind of education instills a certain very definite attitude to life. Aldous Huxley went to Eton which is the public school of public schools. It is the cream. All the top men in the foreign office and in politics and in law and indeed too in the church are graduates of Eton. And uh, they, the poor boys there wear the most ridiculous clothes. They wear short monkey jackets and long pants without turn-ups at the bottom that are vaguely dark gray in color and very wide starched collars and black neckties and top hats. Every unfortunate child that is admitted to Eton has to, has to wear this outfit. When you get older, they graduate uh, to long jackets instead of the short ones. The short jackets are there to enable them to be more easily flogged. And the, the, the entire discipline of the English school is based on flogging. And you will find in Aldous Huxley's novels a perennial interest in the subject because uh, that is a kind of mark uh, instilled into English life. Uh, and, and they take a peculiar pride in it. And uh, there's a, quite a discourse you'll remember at one point in Ireland where uh, he shows that uh, all cultures based on flogging, uh, where the children are brought up that way, spare the rod and spoil the child, as in the book of Proverbs, believe that God is totally other. God is transcendent and authoritative and the father figure. Whereas cultures not based on flogging uh, go to tatvam asi, that is to say the fundamental identity of the root and ground of the individual being with the root and ground of the universe. It's an amusing aside. It's not quite accurate, but <laughs> it's very fascinating. But you see, he came out of this background in, in, these, in these English schools, uh, <clears throat> they're all basically Church of England. There are a few public schools that are Roman Catholic or Presbyterian. One of the worst public schools of all is, is Fetters in Scotland, which is very aristocratic and very rigorous and Presbyterian. And you can imagine how ghastly the combination of Calvinism 
and uh, spare the rod and spoil the child and plain food can be. The food, incidentally, in these schools is unspeakable. English cooking is not very good at the best, but they have, for example, they, they, they know how to boil a roast of beef to make it utterly unpalatable and to boil vegetables so that they are a kind of conglomeration of evil tasting and evil smelling string and how to put s together puddings that are nothing but rolls of suet which are cut in slice and then they pour corn syrup over it and that's dessert <laughs> or sometimes they have dried prunes you know you can dry prunes and then you put them in the pot and boil them and the most unspeakable results but that is 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 good for you in fact, all these schools are fundamentally based on the idea that suffering builds character. And so anything that you inflict by way of suffering on the younger children is justified because you know you are doing them a service. In other words, you can lash them and pull their hair, you can hang them upside down by their heels, you can throw bricks at them, you can do anything and torture them in all sorts of ways. We had, for example, a boy in school who was Mohammedan and was excused from church services. And he was an object of utter contempt and derision. And But we believed in his powers of prayer. Uh, e every Thursday we had to have the ROTC training parades and everybody hated it because you had to shine your buttons and do all this kind of stuff and spend a whole afternoon drilling. And so every Thursday we would make this unfortunate Mr. Kasimov pray for rain. And he would have to kneel on the floor and make all the motions that a Mohammedan was supposed to go through. And it was surprising how often it worked. <laughs> because it rained the, if it rained, the ROTC parade was cancelled. I mean, think of this as training for war. Imagine. <laughs> so, uh, the, the, the whole philosophy basically was suffering builds character. Therefore, the infliction of suffering upon one's inferiors is justified. And as you go up the hierarchy through your four years, you see, you become privileged at the end to inflict suffering uniquely and to have no suffering inflicted upon you. Then you, you're, a, you're of the true blue, you're of blood, as they sometimes call them. And uh, on the other side, one might say on the positive side of this education, uh, it, it really is quite extraordinary how much you learn of a certain kind of knowledge. When we were 16 years old, we were reading Plato in Greek. When we uh, were 15 years old, we finished our general education. That is to say, we took an examination, which is called the school certificate, and that qualifies you as being generally educated in mathematics, foreign languages, Latin, Greek, history, geography, and such matters. Thereafter, you start specializing. And you can go into mathematics or uh, chemistry and physics. They don't divide those at first. Uh, for example, if you're taking a pre-med training, you go into chemistry and physics and a bit of biology. If uh, you're going to be a clergyman, you take medieval history or classical languages, Latin and Greek. If you're going to be a lawyer, you take history. Uh, or you can specialize in English, uh, in romance languages, uh, and so on. And from 15 on, when you take this, you specialize. So that the, the end years of a British gentleman's education correspond to at least two or three years of college in this country. So that by the time he does go to college, he goes to, say, Oxbridge, Oxford or Cambridge, uh, <clears throat> he is completely specialized. No more general courses on anything. And his method of going through college in the days in which Huxley went through college was very different from what we would go through now in college in the United States because you're absolutely on your own. Nobody gives a damn what you do with your time. All they ask is that you pass the examinations at the end of your three years. See, they have three years, generally, get through. 
Now, if you're a gentleman, you must never give the appearance of doing any work. So all the time you're actually in college, you're supposed to devote yourself to frivolities, to sports, to an amazing parties, great dinners, to outrageous exploits like climbing towers and putting chamber pots on the highest possible pinnacles, and uh, all these sorts of exploits. Then they have what they call the long vacation. They have ten weeks of summer vacation, and that's when you're supposed to hit the books. You go home to your country estate with the books and really bone up on everything, you see, so that you can make the effect of getting through college without turning a finger. Well, now the system, though, on, in college, uh, it isn't, that's an exaggeration. I've given an extremely exaggerated point of view because a lot of people actually do work there because they do encourage uh, very deep uh, intellectual studies, but they have a most interesting method. Uh, you, you don't you don't have to take prescribed courses. You're assigned a tutor who is usually a fellow of the college to which you're, of which you're a member. See, uh, Oxford and Cambridge are a complex of colleges. They're not the same as fraternities or sororities, although they do fulfill some of those functions. They are dormitories. But every man has his own room and each college is made up of a series of staircases. And every staircase has a servant, a manservant, who makes the beds and serves meals for the gentlemen in their rooms. And uh, although they eat in hall, they can also eat in their rooms privately for a certain fee. And you can have wine. The colleges have marvelous wine cellars. You buy from the college cellar. And uh, it's a very, very urbane, sophisticated atmosphere. But as I say, you're assigned a tutor when you go in. <clears throat> and he guides your studies. He says, now, what are your interests? What, what uh, kind of specialization are you going in for? Etc., etc. And then he assigns you uh, to the right professors. He says, now, you ought to listen to Professor So-and-so. He gives lectures every so often. And you ought to go to Professor So-and-so and Professor So-and-so, and then here's a bibliography, and you must read all this. And then we'll have a meeting with all the people who are in the same field as you are. We'll meet every Wednesday afternoon, and we'll read papers. Uh, each member of the group will read a paper to the others. The great philosopher Wittgenstein, for example, was such a tutor. And uh, uh, there was another Cambridge philosopher who used to lie under the table while his students were reading their papers, and every so often would groan when they <laughs> made some awful platitude. But, uh, <laughs> but generally speaking, tutorial meeting is a very genial affair. People sit around and smoke pipes and uh, drink beer and read their papers and get a first-class criticism from the tutor and the rest of the group. And uh, they attend lectures, as you see, on the side, but nobody ever takes attendance at lectures. Nobody gives a damn who goes. And so you go through your years acquiring knowledge absolutely on your own initiative. Then at the end of the time, you have to pass the tripos, the examinations. And if you make it, they give you your degree. They give you a B.A., and if you spend certain time extra in residence, you become automatically an MA. There is no academic distinction between the BA and the MA. Merely you put in some extra residence. Then, of course, you can go on as a graduate student to the doctorate. Uh, it's a funny thing, but uh, nowadays, although the British educational system puts you far ahead of the American educational system, until graduate school. When it comes to graduate school, they're both equal. They're both on the same academic level. It's a, it's a curious thing, but uh, this is generally recognized. But I'm telling you this as an outline of the sort of educational system to which Aldous Huxley was exposed and which you must understand is in the background of everything he writes. He went to Balliol College in Oxford and was an absolutely outstanding student in English literature. His professor, his tutor, 
said at the end, he said, my goodness, he said, uh, you the most distinguished student in English literature we've had in a long time. He said, you ought to um, do graduate work and um, become a um, professor. And Aldous Huxley said, it's the most extraordinary idea. English literature is not made to be studied, it's made to be enjoyed. And he could never see the idea see, of becoming a professor of literature. So he went on to make it and do it instead of studying it. Well, now you see, uh, underlying this educational system is very generally speaking a philosophy based on Anglicanism. Most of the colleges and the public schools are connected with the Church of England. And the Church of England is one of the most extraordinary institutions on earth, and I have to say something about it so that you get the background. The Church of England is a weird halfway house between Catholicism and Protestantism. Founded by the secession of King Henry VIII from the Church of Rome in the 16th century. And uh, the Church of England is extremely broad-minded. It is the most broad-minded church that there is. After all, you may think that you're being broad-minded by being a Congregationalist or a Methodist, but you're not really, because Methodists, for example, uh, are prohibitionists. Whereas in the Anglican Church, you can be a priest in absolutely good standing and be an alcoholic at the same time. <clears throat> you can be, in fact, anything from a papist to a theosophist and be perfectly okay in the Anglican Church. There are Anglican priests who celebrate the Mass in Latin. And there are Anglican priests who would be the equivalent of what is called the liberal Catholic Church, which is... Uh, a kind of mixture of theosophy and Catholicism. Uh, <clears throat> the, the Anglican Church is rather like Shinto in Japan. It's definitely national. Somewhere at the top of the whole business is the king or queen. And everybody who goes to school in the, the public school system feels that he belongs somewhere quite definitely in a hierarchy, at the top of which is the Archbishop of Canterbury and Her Majesty the Queen. And they have a very direct line to God and to Jesus through Jesus Christ, because the apostolic succession, which the Anglican Church is very worried about because the Roman Catholics deny that they really have the apostolic succession, but it passes down by who laid hands on what bishop who laid hands on what bishop who laid hands on what bishop who ultimately had hands laid on him by Jesus Christ. Also, the country is full of the most beautiful architectural monuments of the Anglican Church, both great cathedrals and tiny village parish churches. So there's a sense in belonging to the hierarchy of the, the government and the church, of belonging to also to a historical hierarchy, which begins with... Um, Adam and Eve and Methuselah and all those characters, and uh, then on to Jesus Christ and the apostles, and then St. Augustine who, of Canterbury, Occupo, who brought the religion to England. And I went to school at Canterbury, the oldest of all the schools in England, and uh, where you felt very much connected indeed with the divine dispensation on earth. And uh, you were surrounded with reminders that you were a, indeed a member of this thing. But uh, when we go deeper into this, uh, what is the real philosophy underlying it all? This is an important thing. Now, it depends on how profound you are. Very few people are very profound. And so they, the average man who goes through this educational system doesn't go into it very deeply. And what he gets is uh, rather odd. Uh, he gets the sense, you see, because he belongs to the hierarchy, of a sense of absolutely inflexible righteousness. 
he knows his place. And he knows that he knows and that he is in the order of things. And it's okay. And you can die for it, and that's considered a very noble thing to do. Dulce et decorum est pro patria mari. Uh, it's a very great honor to die for the whole show because you still belong and you'll go to heaven. Well, they all believe they'll go to heaven. I love the story of a great discussion at an English dinner party, what the various guests thought would happen to them when they died. Of course, there are all kinds of far-out people who believe they would be reincarnated or who believe that they would not have any existence beyond death, but would simply disappear, and people who felt they would go to the astral plane. And there was a very distinguished British aristocrat present who was the prominent lay member of the Church of England. And they said, Sir Roderick, what do you think will happen to you when you die? Because he hadn't said anything. He said, <clears throat> I'm perfectly certain that I shall go to heaven and enjoy everlasting bliss, but I wish you wouldn't discuss such a depressing subject. <laughs> <laughs> if you really want to get the mood of this Anglican thing, you should read the poems of John Betjeman. There is nothing like it for suggesting the precise flavor of how the average Englishman feels the Anglican Church. But it does give you this sense, you see, of belonging to both a terrestrial and a celestial hierarchy. But unfortunately, there are some grievous prices to be paid for the privilege. The first problem, and indeed the profound problem of the Anglican Church, is sex. When I was uh, going through school and was uh, <clears throat> being confirmed in the Church of England at about the age of 14, when one finds entrance into puberty in that culture, uh, <clears throat> we uh, were instructed, of course, in the mysteries of the Church and its doctrines. And uh, most of this was history, because this is to some extent an archaeological religion which takes great pride in the past. So we had long lectures on church history and on some of the doctrines of the catechism, but all this culminated in a very, very serious private talk with the school chaplain. And obviously, when you culminate in a serious private talk, that is the initiatory discourse. Then the secret of the fraternity or whatever it is that you're going to belong to is going to be revealed. Well, what do you suppose the secret was? secret was is it's very dangerous to masturbate. You will get nameless diseases, epilepsy, the great Siberian itch, syphilis, gonorrhea, uh, heaven only knows what. It's never specifically named or mentioned, but the most awful things will happen. And boys who do this will develop bags under their eyes, uh, awful pimples, and eventually their brains will rot and come drooling out through their noses. And we all recognize those sort of boys. But uh, this was the great, the great secret. So the, the Christian life, to a very large extent, uh, consists in chastity, in uh, keeping yourself a pure knight of the grail, the holy grail, and uh, avoiding this vice called self-abuse. So this naturally creates the utmost fascination with sex, in, in, especially in boarding schools, where contacts with women are completely forbidden. Uh, the only women in sight are the secretaries and uh, matrons and the nurse, uh, that sort of professional woman. And uh, <laughs> otherwise you're in a world consisting entirely of men. And I had a very interesting friend in school who used to kiss the maids, and uh, one day took out the daughter of the greengrocer for a walk, nothing more than a walk, and was promptly expelled. And he later became a great hero, a brigadier general, who captured the German staff single-handed in Cyprus uh, during the war, in Crete or something. And, uh, but he was expelled, uh, without, without question. He took the girl out for a walk, finished. He was done for. There is complete obsession with keeping the young gentleman chaste. It encourages all kinds of fascinating homosexual detours, 
which last during the school period and generally speaking finish then and there when they get out, although some people become uh, chronically habituated to that particular taste. So there is a very, very vast concern with sex as a result of this. Sex is something prohibited and fascinating just because it is prohibited. And it is, I suppose, a way of encouraging sex like one encourages the growth of trees by pruning them. However, while that may be true for the more liberated spirits who come out of these schools, a lot of people get completely warped. They never get straight with themselves about sex. And that had been going on for a long, long time. It's worse in girls' schools, but I have no personal experience of them. So, uh, when Aldous Huxley started writing novels like Antic Hay and Point Counterpoint and so on, his generation in England and to a lesser extent in this country felt that he was a great liberator. He brought a great breath of fresh air into the whole scene because his point of view was at once sensitive and skeptical. The point of view of the Huxley of those days was sort of Voltairean. A rationalist who referred once to the Old Testament as a remarkable collection of Bronze Age literature. But not a nasty sort of rationalist like um, Colonel Ingersoll or um, <clears throat> he wasn't so testy as Bertrand Russell who was of a similar point of view but a man who loved poetry and Bertrand Russell doesn't have very much poetry who loved the great achievements of European art. It was a very, very good combination, you see, of the sensitive man and the rational man. And so he, he was, for ever so many people, a very wholesome way of breaking out from the attitudes instilled in one by the British system of bourgeois education. But then something happened to Aldous Huxley and many people, many, many people have never forgiven him for it. It happened between 1937 and 1938, somewhere thereabouts. They say he got religion. To be specific, he came under the influence of Gerald Hurd. And something must therefore be said about Gerald Hurd. Gerald Hurd uh, used to be the British Broadcasting Corporation's commentator on science. He used to give regular talks on the London radio on recent advances in science. Uh, like many of us, about 1936 or 7, he saw that Europe was going to part and decided to emigrate to the United States. And he came over here and at first this was lecturing at the Quaker Retreat Center at Pendle Hill near, Pennsylvania, near Philadelphia. And then he came out to Los Angeles and set up a lay monastery at Tribuco in the Santa Ana Mountains. And during the war, Second World War, and a little bit before and after, Tribuco was a great center on the West Coast. All sorts of people, important people, used to go and listen to Gerald Hurd hold forth on the mystical life. Gerald Hurd has been described as a metaphysical anthropologist. He's a man of, of, of vast interests. His conversation is witty and brilliant and full of all sorts of curious anecdotes. He will tell you the latest weird things that are being done in the sciences. 
And he's full of this. And you always wonder whether he isn't a little bit credulous. And he's so fascinating to listen to that nobody can remember after he's through what he said. He's has a ginger beard and uh, is a most amusing, almost a compulsive talker. I mean, at the end of an evening, he's still talking and he just has to be carried off talking. <laughs> but he is a very, very interesting man. Well, at this time, when he had the Tribuco lay monastery, which both men and women attended, his attitude to the spiritual life was predominantly ascetic. That is to say, he gravitated towards that long, long tradition of religious philosophy, which we could call roughly Manichaean or Gnostic. And this in our whole study is very important that you understand what this is. This term, Manichaean, refers to a dualistic attitude in which the world is conceived, the material world, the physical world is conceived as a deterioration. The good thing is spirit and spirituality. And man is viewed as being a spirit captured, imprisoned, lost in the world of flesh. In Gnostic philosophy, they distinguish between three kinds of people. On the lowest level, there are Hylic people. H-Y-L-I-C, Hylic, from the Greek hile, meaning wood. And they are the absolute uh, ordinary bums who have no prospect of salvation. They will die and disappear. Next in order are psychic people. That doesn't mean psychic in the sense of being clairvoyant, but as having a soul. And they are in a terrible position because they are halfway between and nobody uh, has any good word to say for the people halfway between. They have aspirations to spirituality, but not really the capacity. And so they suffer horribly for having souls, but never really get free from matter. Then finally there are pneumatic people, not in the sense of being well padded, but in the sense of being pnefma, the Greek word, spiritual. See. And those are the people who are capable by immense intellectual and moral effort to overcome all attachment to the body, to every kind of physical delight for food or for sex or for aesthetic beauty, and enter into a world of pure intellection and abstraction, and thus be liberated. And you see in what way this is related to the Platonic and even more to the Neoplatonic philosophy of the world as a deterioration, a fall into matter from an originally purely spiritual condition. And this has an ancestry going behind uh, Neoplatonic philosophy to India, to a Greek, a kind of garbled Greek form of Vedanta called Orphism, the Orphic Mysteries, were originally Indian ideas passed through Persia and coming to Greece or passing through Alexandria to Greece. We don't really know how they got there. But the, 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 the superstitious popular idea of Vedanta as the discipline whereby the individual is enabled to release himself from physical existence from the round of being reincarnated again and again and again and again in this veil of tears. So that finally you disappear, you have no longer the embarrassment of a body. All this is basically hatred of being a body. Now this is a very understandable point of view for peoples living in a culture of imperfect medicine and sanitation. We don't sufficiently appreciate this because we live in relative physical comfort. 
in the times of which I am speaking, especially in Europe and India, the excluding clause here is because China and Japan were relatively clean. But the people lived in what we would regard as unspeakable filth. To begin with, they didn't have dentistry. And so everybody had halitosis. And imagine with their mouths full of decaying teeth. They didn't wash very much. In Rome they did, but this was regarded by the Christians as extreme decadence. And one of the first things that Christianity abolished was baths. <coughs> it's very funny. <laughs> it's a cleanliness is next to godliness. There's nothing of the kind. The dirtier you were, the holier you were. When, uh, say in Christianity around 300 A.D., uh, medieval cities stank. All the sewage was simply poured into the street, and if you had to be careful walking along, it didn't land on your head, and someone threw it out of an upper story window. Persons of quality carried nosegays, that is to say, bunches of flowers in which they could put their noses all the time. Even as late as uh, the 18th century, in, say, the great marble palaces of Versailles, the, the, the staircases were covered with human excrement. And the only toilet arrangements in the whole palace was a commode constantly occupied by his and her majesty because they took tremendous purges because of the luxurious French food that they ate designed by Monsieur Carême and people like that, you know. And they ate and ate these things. They had chronic indigestion, so they took terrific purges and were always on these commodes. And unbelievably filthy. So you can well, you can understand when <clears throat> the body is smelly and its corruption is noticed all around you and when you're full of aches and pains and uh, so on, you can very well appreciate a philosophical point of view which says, let's get rid of this carcass. Let's transcend it. And you see, only in countries where they've had good health and cleanliness and that sort of thing do we find philosophies of real affection for having and being a physical body. So to escape the body is the dominant motif of all that kind of religious philosophy that we could call maniche. Christianity, theoretically, wishes to divinize the body. The, the basic doctrine of Christianity, what constitutes a person as a Christian, is not that he's good, but he believes that Jesus Christ, as a historical human being, was God in the flesh. To believe in the divinity, the Godhead of Jesus, constitutes what is being a Christian. And the idea, you see, the theoretical idea behind Christianity is that <clears throat> through the historical Jesus, God, the divine, begins to unite itself with the physical universe, to transform the physical universe completely, so that the whole uh, physical universe will eventually be completely spiritualized. That's why Orthodox Christians believe in the resurrection of the body. That's why they have sacraments. That's why they use physical means, water, bread, wine, oil, and physical actions as an essential part of their religion. But Christians, you see, although they believe theoretically in the union of the spiritual and the physical domains, don't really believe in it because they always damn the physical world with faint praise. And they imagine when they do get it thoroughly transfigured that it really won't be physical anymore. In other words, the resurrection body, as in the story of the Gospels, is able to walk through walls. It has no limitations, it has no weight, and it certainly has no sex. For in the kingdom of heaven they shall neither be marriage nor giving in marriage, but they shall be as the angels. And the angels, you see, are sexless creatures. They are neither male nor female. A proper angel is not a female in a white nighty, uh, as in decadent modern religious art. A proper angel is an androgyne, a hermaphroditic 
being who uh, is actually a pure spirit and has no body of any kind except a, what might be called a spiritual body, but a, a body of an angel has very odd properties. An angel can be where it thinks. So an angel could be simultaneously on the four corners of this table, one angel, because it can think of the four corners separately and therefore be in those different places all at once. And so the question of how many angels can dance on the point of a pin is really the question how many angels can think of the point of a pin, because they can all be there by thinking of it. See? So the angel is sexless. And this is the real nub of the whole matter, you see. The problem of sex for these generations and these people who lived in these conditions is this, that sex is the fatal fascination for the body. What a beautiful thing, the body of the other sex or one's own sex, for that matter, is. How delightful. How fascinated I can get with it, but what a trap. Because this thing to which I get attached, and which I become fascinated, it develops a personality. And this person, I think, is so beautiful, has quirks and neuroses, and furthermore, they begin to fall apart. They get old and wrinkled, and then eventually they turn into a bunch of stinking worms. What a trap that is, you see. So avoid it. Avoid it, avoid it. Now, in those days, <clears throat> Gerald Hurd's philosophy was somewhat influenced by that point of view. And he, I, I, I remember very well how upset he was when his leading male disciple married his leading female disciple. That was a sad day for Tribuca. But since that time, uh, Gerald Hurd has recovered. <laughs> 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 yeah, and in those days also, his work was very closely associated, in an informal way, with the Vedanta Society of Southern California. And that is a very ambiguous philosophy. The Vedantists assert on the one hand that everything is Brahman. In other words, everything at any stage of its development, at any moment, is the Godhead in disguise. And not so much in disguise. If you've got eyes to see, it's perfectly obvious that everything is divine. And there are certain states of consciousness into which one can move, and that's it's just so. It's just like that. It's just that simple. While they maintain this on the one hand, on the other hand, they say, well, in order to realize this, though, in the way we understand realizing it, you've got to be able to behave as if everything were divine, both morally and emotionally. When I first came to Los Angeles in 1951, in the spring, a tea party was arranged, to which I was invited at the Vedanta Society's center. The host was Swami Prabhavananda, and the guests were Aldous Huxley, Christopher Isherwood, and many celebrities. And uh, it was a very, very extraordinary occasion, because I had said in a lecture a few nights before that the ecstasy of sexual experience was analogous to something of the same kind as the mystical ecstasy or what the Hindus call samadhi. And this was reported back to the authorities uh, at the Vedanta Society and I gather met with grave disapproval <clears throat> because it seemed this tea party was an attempt to put me on the spot. It was very fascinating because uh, the room was like a, a, one of those stages created for a French farce, where there are places <laughs> full of doors, you know, people can go in and out, and suddenly all these doors started opening, and various women came out and said, I'm Sister Sushila, I'm Sister uh, something or other, you know, Sister Karma, Sister Nirvana, Sister Parabrahm, <laughs> so on, all these girls came out, some of them were quite attractive, they weren't old biddies by any means, you know, and... Uh, <laughs> 
They all sat down and they served tea. And then uh, one of the sisters said, uh, Mr. Watts, what do you think of the teachings of Krishnamurti? And uh, I said, I dug Krishnamurti, but I thought he was just great. The Swami said, well, he's personally a very fine man, but um, his, his doctrine is... Uh, you know? And <laughs> why, why, why? Because Krishnamurti doesn't teach a method. I mean, there isn't something you can do. There aren't meditations, there aren't exercises. When you ask Krishnamurti, what exercises, what methods will lead me to integration, uh, psychological health, nirvana, paradise, the knowledge of God, mystical experience, he'll say, why do you want it? And then he shows you slowly that the reason you want all those things is based on your old unregenerate self and that you're just trying to enlarge your ego and continue your ego. And he does that and he goes at that and that's all he does. That's his only method, you see. It's a very good, it's a kind of a Zen-like technique. But they disapproved of Krishnamurti very much because he didn't teach a method. And finally, uh, Aldous Huxley started asking very, very difficult questions. He just kept on raising the issue that was under discussion. Was there really anything, any way, was there any discipline that could lead to the liberation experience? And I said, no, there isn't, because you're there already. You see, what is the doctrine? That art thou. And it means exactly what it says, here and now, and, and what you have to do, you see, is accept it. Well, the Swami got more and more uncomfortable about this, and he said some story about this idea being proposed to Sri Ramakrishna, and Sri Ramakrishna saying, if that is your Vedanta, I spit on it. And finally he said, but if you are really Brahman, you are beyond pain. You see, Brahman cannot feel a pinch. Well, I had the worst. <laughs> but I, I couldn't. Here he was surrounded with all his disciples. And I didn't, you know, I didn't want to make a fool of him. He was in this situation. So... Aldous was a, he was a devil. He, he didn't make any solutions. He simply stimulated the argument, put oil on the fire by raising all these questions. You see. And he did it in the most polite, the most genial manner. <laughs> so, uh, but he, you see, all along was always alive to this problem. Now, If you take his writing, let's say at the time of the first, the first book in which you notice a change from the sensitive skeptic is Eilis in Gaza, and then particularly Ends and Means, which was published in England in 1937. Then uh, a very fascinating book called Grey Eminence. Biography of Father Joseph, spiritual advisor to Cardinal Richelieu. At, at that moment, that comes just before the perennial philosophy. At that moment, Aldous Huxley is right under the Gerald Hurd of those days seeking a, a mystical experience that will really offer release from the embarrassment of the body. Take other uh, novel, After Many a Summer Dies the Swan. Mr. Propter in that novel is Gerald Hurd. And the, the, the wealthy man is, of course, William Randolph Hearst, and uh, his palace is San Simeon, and the quest for physical immortality ends up in this ghastly uh, parody of people returning to an ape-like existence, but nevertheless hundreds of years old. 
And you can see there that the, the theme of that book is how embarrassing and disgusting the human body is. And through a great deal of Aldous Huxley's writing, before then and at that time, there is the feeling, what an absurd bag of bones we are. In so many ways, all his writing about sex is sex as the ludicrous, as the undignified, as the moment in which the cultured human being becomes an absurd barbarian. <coughs> At that time, uh, the critic C.S. Savage wrote an article about Aldous Huxley's work in the Sewanee Review, in which he said, you must not think that there's been any essential change in Huxley. Uh, the original satirical, sensitive skeptic was a master at pulling people apart and of showing how disgusting they really are. The new mystical Huxley is just the same thing because now he's still against existence. Instead of deriding it and showing how funny it is, he now wants to dissolve it in the cosmic acid of the undifferentiated aesthetic continuum. The, the suchness, the Brahman, the cosmic sea of perfectly formless goo. And uh, this was partly true in those days. That is to say, in the 1940s, roughly, the general trend of both Gerald Hurd's and Aldous Huxley's thinking was Manichaean, was to get rid of, transcend, and surpass the embarrassment of the body and of the differentiations the variety, the finitude of physical existence. That was the time I first knew Huxley, and I met him courtesy of Ruth Sasaki, my ex-mother-in-law, who was Mrs. Zen. When she was in New York and uh, had her... Uh, master there, Mr. Sasaki, and his, the temple. Uh, she invited Aldous Huxley to tea one afternoon, and uh, he was just fascinating. You know, he was the most incredible conversationalist. He used to talk very largely about what he was writing about at the time, but in such a beautiful way. I remember once when we had him for lunch at the Tokyo Skiaki restaurant here in San Francisco, all the neighboring tables stopped talking so that they could listen in. Because what he used to do, <clears throat> he would get the most horrendous information that he had got lately about how things were really going to pieces. And he could tell this in a way that had everybody <laughs> just <laughs> electrified their hair standing on end. I know he was holding forth uh, the first time I met him on fashions in medicine. He said, do you realize that... Uh, now, not so long ago, they used to operate on people by removing the whole of the long intestine. He said the only problem was they had to go to the toilet like birds about every seven minutes. <laughs> he said nobody has ever benefited by this. And suddenly the whole operation was completely dropped and forgotten about. And he gave a, an enormous list of extraordinary things that had been done in quite modern times in medicine and had been all the rage and then completely forgotten and dropped. Or then he was talking at another time about um, subliminal advertising and how you could expose on television a product and while you were showing that product, flash for one thousandth of a second Marilyn Monroe in the nude. And the people wouldn't even know they'd seen it but would always have a good feeling about that particular product for reasons they could never understand. <laughs> And he, <laughs> holding on, and the, the, the dreadful possibilities, in other words, of uh, advertising. But he had interlarded this with information. Of, he'd go to the positive side and talk about the experiments being done with a tachistoscope, 
which is a thing that will flash a picture in front of you for, say, a thousandth of a second. At the University of Ohio, and uh, how, you know, this was a way of developing intuitive knowledge and how you could learn to memorize eight-figure numbers or read them without a second's hesitation if they were flashed in front of you for a thousandth of a second. It's just a matter of practice. And he'd get fascinated in all these things as developments of the mind. So after a conversation with Aldous Huxley, everybody came away immensely stimulated.